title of this talk is From Puff to Protect the Key, Security Components for the IoT. So on Christmas Eve, we all wait for Santa Claus to enter our houses and bring presents. He typically enters through the chimney and we just trust him not to steal any belongings or uh, break some stuff because Santa is a good guy. <laughs> um, in reality, however, there are also bad guys out there, bad frosties, Grinches and thieves that pretend to be Santa. And to preserve the holy night, we need to protect from these adversaries. Now, in the Internet of Things, we have a very similar situation. Tiny and faithful things, like gingerbread men or Christmas tea decorations, connect to the evil white Internet. Internally, these devices typically are built upon microcontrollers with very constrained resources. But now, what if Santa became an evil hacker? Again, to preserve the holy night, we need to protect from this bad Santa. In practice, communication needs to be secured, similarly to the big machines in the Internet, since the adversaries do not suffer from constraints like the IoT does. Security involves cryptographic operations, which are expensive or infeasible on common IoT devices that are driven by a small battery. Now, in the remainder of this talk, I will cover four topics, one for every advent, alongside the Star of Bethlehem. The first topic, uh, in the first topic, I will present common hardware properties of resource-constrained IoT devices that all have one objective in common, being cheap and simple. Next, I will talk about an old and evergreen topic, random number generation, which is the root of security in almost all systems. Thereby, we will look at common sources of randomness in the IoT, randomness requirements, as well as performance measurements. Furthermore, I will introduce in this section the topic of PUFFs, so-called physical unclonable functions, as a source of unpredictability. This chapter will probably be the largest one in this talk. Then, IoT devices vary widely in their hardware capabilities. Some have powerful crypto accelerators, others don't, and utilize software alternatives. To enable security at best performance, the crypto should be optimized and utilize constraints hardware most efficiently. We present performance benchmarks, or why do I say we actually? I do perform, uh, present performance benchmarks on symmetric and asymmetric uh, crypto operations that we perform on IoT devices with and without crypto hardware in place. And finally, effective security is tied to the usability of cryptographic interfaces. Hence, I will finally present our implementation concept of a common cryptographic API to integrate the zoo of existing crypto and software, hardware and software crypto backends. Let's start with an overview about the prevalent constraints in the IoT. RFC 7228, and I'm sorry, I need to minimize this because I always see what the other people do and I don't want to. Okay, maybe that's a bit better. So, RFC class provides a rough classification for uh, common IoT resources that we have in nowadays. Class 0 devices provide less than K RAM and 100K ROM, which is the case for common AVR8 Arduino platforms. Then Class 1, which provides around 10K RAM and 100K of ROM. And Class 2, which is a prevalent device class in the IoT nowadays that we will mostly deal with throughout this talk. Class 2, provides a ROM, provide, class 2 devices provide around 250K of ROM, 50K of RAM which is sufficient to operate an operating to use an operating system and operate network stacks with common cryptography. Let me give you an overview of some specific platforms that we also use throughout this evaluation and their hardware security assistance methods and mechanisms. So there's the IoT lab node, which is part of the FIT IoT lab testbed, which we use a lot, as you will see, which provides no hardware measures at all, not even a random number generator or random source is available on this platform. And this is not really uncommon in the IoT. Not everyone gets a full security package for Christmas. Luckily, the three kings of the East brought three modern platforms to the IoT with uh, new and novel security features. First, the NRF52 microcontroller, which provides a true random source, first of all. And additionally to that, it provides a wide collection of symmetric and asymmetric crypt elliptic curve-based crypto accelerators. Second, there's the NRF91, which adds protected, protected on-key chip storages to the microcontroller, as well as the trusted execution environment. This is particularly useful to isolate vulnerable code paths 
for example, applications, drivers, or whatever untrusted libraries can be separated uh, from security modules and uh, cannot access the memory that the security modules operate on. This is to protect against software bugs in the first place, but also against um, attacks that introduce buffer runs or the like, um, which could interfere with crypto data structures. And third, there are the so-called secure elements that connect to any microcontroller via I2C. This involves an extra chip, which on the, on the counter side adds device cost, but on the other end, it relieves, it relieves the requirements on the main controller. As a side note, we are in contact with the people from ARM and they consider these secure elements as the future of IoT security in terms of hardware. Secure elements commonly provide two random sources, a smaller collection of cryptographic algorithms that are implemented in hardware, which are executed in a somehow isolated and hence trusted, execution, trusted environment. Most notably, these devices come with, with a bank of temporary key storages. That means cryptographic keys are generated on the device and stored on the device. So that also means that operations on these keys, for instance, uh, encryptions, have to be operated on the device since the key never leaves the trusted storage. Furthermore, these devices typically provide something like an auto erasure circuit uh, in electronics or in hardware, that means that on the temper detection event, the, the keys are erased by the hardware. So, let's move on to the advent of unpredictability. We first look at random number generation. Where are random numbers used in the IoT? IoT applications such as blinking Christmas pullovers utilize randomized blink pattern. There are other applications such as machine learning, randomized sampling or wireless access layers that utilize random numbers and more seriously all sorts of security protocols um, include encryption, authentication and the like which work on keys, signatures, initialization values that must be largely unpredictable and based on random numbers. So note, we distinguish two sorts of random number generators or randomness consumers basically, that's what I wanted to say. So. Um, on the one hand, there are consumers that either utilize the, crypto number, the random numbers for crypto purpose, protocols such as TLS or the like, and then there are simple IoT lights, IoT lights like a pullover or whatever, non-security applications that utilize general purpose numbers. To summarize the requirements of both types of generators, the general purpose random numbers should be uniformly distributed and statistically independent. For the Christmas tree or for my pullover, however, it wouldn't hurt too bad if there is certain repetition of the randomized pattern or if we could somehow predict it. Start values should vary across device resets and devices themselves, of course. Maybe this is very clear to others, but I uh, just wanted to give an example why this is so important. A reoccurring issue that we have in Riot and we maybe all of the IT lab users faced it before is uh, which happens in deployments of multi-node experiments on this fit IT testbed. Now as we saw earlier, the nodes that we have available at this testbed platform don't provide any means of randomness. That means um, when they run protocols and all start at the same time, they all start sending at the same time, which just leads to orchestrated wireless interference. Furthermore, machine learning algorithms make heavy use of random numbers. They need a lot of random numbers in yeah, as short as possible uh, time measure, which conflicts with the energy constraints of, uh, of constrained uh, IoT resources. Yeah, so that means general purpose numbers should be as efficient as possible to be frugal with battery resources. On the other hand, the requirements for crypto purpose or secure, cryptographically secure random numbers in contrast have much stronger requirements. That means they must be absolutely indistinguishable from truly random. Uh, now what does it mean? For an attacker it must be infeasible to predict, to predict any future or past sequence that the random number generator produced. A short look ahead. Crypto generators utilize deterministic pseudo random number generators that consist of a cryptographic function, a, a one-way function, and an unpredictable seed value. Thereby the seed mostly determines the system security by the amount of entropy contained. Now, uh, what is entropy again? 
um, let's have a look at what our friends Shannon and Neumann said to this topic. I thought of calling it information, but the word was overly used, so I decided to call it uncertainty. For Neumann told me, you should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used in statistical mechanics under that name, so it already has a name. In the second place, and more important, nobody knows what entropy really is, so in a debate you will always have the advantage. <laughs> Basically, entropy is a measure of information and uncertainty. But entropy gathering and crypto operations are challenging on IoT devices. Hence, the complexity of cryptographic random numbers still must remain feasible to be operated with device constraints in the IoT. In addition to that, and depending on the resources in place, there are optional parameters with which we could increase the security, hopefully, of our random number generators. Just to mention two of them, there's on the one hand a mechanism called health tests that operates during runtime and monitors the vitality of the random number generator that is currently operated. And furthermore, reset me reset mechanisms uh, persist that add randomness and or entropy to the entropy pool during operation in the case of an intermediate system break. Yeah, so which sources of randomness do we have commonly in the IoT? There are three classes of uh, random number generators that persist. There are the uh, unseeded generators, typically known as true random number generators. There are the seeded pseudo random number generators and hybrids. As indicated earlier, certain platforms provide hardware-based on-chip true random number generators. Um, internally, these devices have to sample from the physical random process. And eventually they implement in hardware a conditioning stage to, to improve the quality, the statistical qualities of the entropy output samples. Just my two cents, I think this, these true random number generators are actually a bit dangerous because they drive a false sense of security. First, the random sampling electronic that produces and samples the entropy source is typically not well documented in the reference manuals that we have available. And in the second place, how can you actually enforce a random event to happen? Nevertheless, the outputs of these true random number generators can be used for seed generation and they are often also used uh, by applications directly. Other approaches sample external noise sources such as sensors or typically also antenna noise. Naturally, such values contain only few bits per entropy sample. Hence, they still require kind of a conditioning to create a high quality seed value. Some platforms provide general purpose or cryptographically secure hardware pseudo random number generators, which still requires a proper seeding. Other microcontrollers don't have any means of hardware assistance at all and operate pseudo random number generators in software. Similarly to the hardware version, we still need a seed value. And finally, hybrids that seeds, that seeds themselves and operate a further random number generator in hardware. This is topically the case for the external secure elements. All of these hardware and software based mechanisms should be, in the best case, accessed through a northbound OS level API. So we analyze the statistics um, of hardware based random number generators. For that, we use a common test suite by NIST, which applies 15 test cases to random sequences and compares the tested input sequence uh, against the hypothesis of perfect randomness. I don't want to bore you with all the details here, probably also takes too long. Just in a nutshell, a test passes if it lies above a significant interval, so it accepts the hypothesis of perfect randomness, these are the gray bars, or it fails otherwise. We first look at on-chip generators and the results reveal a diverse picture. So the STM32F4 platform systematically fails one test. It turns out that this is an actual, an actual weakness of the device. Just last year there was another uh, paper that analyzed hardware random sources and they found the same weakness of this device. Even worse is the CC2538, um, which fails most of the tests. After digging a bit deeper, uh, in my measurement programs, it turns out that this device actually only implements a very simple general purpose um, pseudo random number generator in hardware, which is seeded internally with an ADC sample. While one could argue that this is a bad implementation or purely documented, it shows the danger with integrating such devices into an OS. 
Next is the KW22D platform, which simply passes all tests, but it's worth to say that the reference manual of this device still recommends against using this out the outputs as crypto purpose numbers, but rather for seeding. And the NREF52, which I introduced earlier, fails many tests, which is actually expected from true entropy sources. There's a configuration option that reduces the bias of samples, which makes all tests pass. Still, this comes to additional complexity, as we will see in a moment. So, we also uh, analyzed ah, yeah. We analyzed the statistics of the external crypto secure element, um, which seeds itself and operates a crypto hardware generator, which unsurprisingly passes all tests smoothly. So, um, we measure the performance, in this case, the average throughput of each generator in a stream of random bytes which also reveals a diverse picture. The performance ranges from 3 kilobytes up to 2,000 kilobytes per second. The fastest in this case is the STM32F4 platform. The external device is the slowest with 3 kilobytes per second. And the bias correction of the NRF52 platform costs around a factor of, of 2. All in all, we should take away one thing. Integrating this heterogeneous hardware into an OSS chain engine so as a developer, you should know your platform well. So, even more fun are the software-based pseudo-random number generators that we analyzed as well and perform our, our experiments on the STM32F4 platform. Note, this is all software that we are operating here. So, uh, here for the statistical analysis, we use a uh, stricter test suite, the die harder test suite that might, most of you might, or some of you might have seen already, so the standard Linux tool. And we encode the results similarly to the NIST results, with the difference that weak results can now be indicated by the black bars. We include three crypto purpose generators. All of them, unsurprisingly, pass the test suite smoothly. All the other generators that we see on that slide are known to be insecure, have weaknesses, are not meant for crypto purpose, but still only few of the statistical tests actually fail. Nevertheless, there is a difference in performance. Crypto generators perform at 40 to 400 kilobytes per second, thereby the so-called Fortuna generator is the slowest um, and it has another problem. It requires kilobytes of memory, which is infeasible to operate on many resource-constrained IoT devices. The SHA-256 generator performs around 10 times faster than the Fortuna and is our recommendation for the IoT. Then the general purpose generator, which produces 3 to 8,000 kilobytes per second, this is around four times faster than the aforementioned hardware generators, thereby the XOR shift is the fastest among all the alternatives, but it has some statistical weaknesses. So uh, we choose the good old Knut LCG in the, as the second fastest uh, generator that uh, passes the test suite smoothly and choose this as a default configuration in Riot. Now to conclude, Crypto generators occur comparably slow to the crypto operations involved in the generation process. Choose your generator wisely according to system resources. General purpose gen uh, random number generators uh, or pseudo random number generators are faster than hardware based randomness, hence, we only want to use hardware true random number generators for seeding. To give a little bit of a better comparison or more visually appealing comparison among the performances of crypto generators. We also show the average time per integer on the left side and the average current consumption as well as energy consumption per integer on the right. Clearly we see the first group, uh, the general purpose uh, pseudo-random generators which perform most efficient. Slower are the on-chip hardware-based random number generators, although some of them decrease the current consumption, the energy per integer is still nice above general purpose software. Cryptographic pseudo random number generators are more expensive. And finally, the external secure element requires most of the resources, although it notably decreases the average or even the peak current flow. Halbzeiten. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, by the way, does this distract from the... No, no it's good. Then I leave it on. Let's move on to another topic that relates to randomness and unpredictability. 
as we saw, there are platforms that don't provide randomness at all. The IoT Lab testbed, the IoT Lab testbed node, for instance, which I described in the beginning and also indicated some issues that we have in the right community with experience, blah, blah, blah. Of course, we have some solutions for this, and here so called PUFFs come into play. So, PUFF stands for physical, physical unclonable function. PUFFs extract intrinsic hardware variations that persist due to manufacturing processes of the device. These variations act as a digital fingerprint of a, of a device which is hidden inside the physical structure of the device. So it's not meant to be built into this, it's just a natural consequence of inaccuracies during the manufacturing process. So the fact that it's hidden in the, fiddle, in the physical structure makes it typically hard to predict it and of course to clone it, otherwise we wouldn't call it unclonable functions. So this fingerprint or puff is secret and identifies the device like a human fingerprint. And note that also like a human fingerprint, these puffs are typically affected by certain noise. Disagree? Well, if you, if you keep your finger secret, then the print is secret as well. <laughs> so um, there are two components in the puff. Um, the identity part and the noisy part. And the question is, what can we do with this? The noise component can, surprise, surprise, be used to generate random numbers or random seeds to start pseudo random number generators. Now, as we learned earlier in this talk, we require variations across reboots of the same device. We call this intra device variations. The ID part can be used to extract a device unique identity or a secret key, which enables many use cases. For example, uh, software based secure storage, which is encrypted with a PUF key. Or a PUF key can be used to identify a device for authentication purposes. It can also be used for application to device bindings like um, secure boot systems. All this is possible since the device is the only entity that can produce this secret value. So, such a key requires inter device variations. Different devices should be mostly different and to preserve uniqueness of a key and unpredictability. Um, to remain secret, it must be unclonable, surprise, and it must also be re reproducible. What does that mean? That means that the, de the device must be able to reliably reconstruct the secret regardless of some noise level up front. In practice, a variety of puffs exist that based on ring escalator latencies, microelectromechanical systems, flip flop sensors, optics, and the list is longer. Most notably, another puff source is SRAM, which is available on almost all IoT devices. The startup state of uninitialized SRAM memory cells are unpredictable. So, when you power them on, some cells always tend to logical one others always tend to logical zero, and then there's a certain amount that fluctuate, and um, this is the aforementioned noise in the puff response. And many of these memory cells together form a device unique pattern. Now the very cool thing about this is that the secret value only persists a very short time directly after the startup. It doesn't have to be stored on a non-volatile memory or the like. While the device is asleep, which is the prevalent state of an IoT device to save battery resources, it is just built into the physical structure but it's not stored directly in any memory. Um, yeah. On the other hand, during operation of a device, the operating system has long overwritten and utilized the memory that was used to form the secret. So, unsurprisingly, we will show some measurements of this mechanism. We will try first to quantify the properties of pure uninitialized SRAM. For that, we use the Hamming distance metric, which is a measure, measure of distance, so dissimilarity. Let me give you two quick examples to understand this metric a little bit better. So the Hamming distance between two input strings A and B that are equal is zero. There is no distance between them. Whereas in the second case, the distance between two inverse four-bit long sequences is four. We introduce a fractional Hamming distance here, which simply divides by the length of the bit string. In both the examples that I gave, it is possible to fully reveal sequence B from sequence A, 
So the maximum unpredictability is indicated by a Hamming, fractional Hamming distance of 0 0.5. So we extract the whole uninitialized RAM of our test platform and compare the pattern of 700 nodes in the FIT IT Lab testbed. Thereby we compare blocks of 1 kilobyte and see, despite the little outlier here at 4 kilobyte, that we almost hit the ideal case of 0 0.5. The outliers introduced by our measurement program, which also utilizes some space uh, in the SRAM, so it operates in this block, and this is why the distances reduce among measurements. We further evaluate the minimum entropy between devices. Remember, entropy is a measure of uh, uncertainty, so a relative minimum entropy of 1 would be the perfect case. Our measurements reveal a um, minimum entropy that lies around 0.75. Practically, that means that every bit of SRAM contains a theoretical min entropy value of 75%. Or to put it a bit differently, if we wanted to retrieve 128 bit of entropy from the SRAM, we would need to consider 171 real world bits of the SRAM. So let's have, let's have a look at the variations on the single device and between reboots on that single device. So basically the thing that we want to use to generate randomness. The Hamming distance now operates at the, at the scale of 0.05 or 5%, which reflects the random noise induced by fluctuating cells. The other 95%, however, reflect the device unique pattern. Consequently, uh, the minimum entropy between device reboots reduces by one order of magnitude compared to the inter device case. Still, if we manage to somehow extract this proportion of fluctuations, we have a source of true randomness. Whereas correcting these flips is somewhat required to make a response reproducible. So every time I start up the device, I need to get rid of these random bit flips to create the same secret. Let's take a picture. So, what do we do? We integrate such a POF module into Riot. I just scratched the surface um, with some high level information because I think this was quite some detail already. Um, how does it look like, and you know, what are the things and the, the building blocks in such a PUF system? First of all, configurations such as SRAM addresses. Where do we start to read out and measure our SRAM uh, pattern? And the length considered. Length, very important to determine the amount of entropy contained in our random seeds or secrets. Um, yeah, the module hooks in very early in the startup sequence to retrieve fresh and uninitialized SRAM memory. Just after that, the actual OS kernel initializes, followed by modules in it, and finally protocols and applications during operation. The first stage of the PATH module is a so-called reset detection or soft reset detection mechanism to prevent the path from utilizing initialized memory. This is, initialized memory is the case, for instance, if, if there was a device reset without a power off cycle, then the path doesn't work and it shouldn't operate on this known pattern. We implement two seeders, um, one for general purposes, the other for crypto purposes. We learned earlier in this talk that this is very important. And, um, yeah, basically the general purpose seeder uh, is built upon a lightweight hash function, the so-called DEK hash function, it's implemented in Riot, whereas the secure seeder involves a cryptographic hash function. We also implement a key generator that is built upon error correction codes to remove the random bit flips. There's lots of uh, lots to say about this error correction schemes. We can discuss this later if you have some interest, otherwise I just skip the details here. Yeah, this uh, key generator also compresses the entropy of plain SRAM readouts. This is important to make the key a full entropy key along its length. This mechanism is not so new, it's known as fuzzy extractor, as extractor in the literature. So, um, what else do we have? Yeah, seeds and keys are stored in a non initialized data section that persists the device and OS startup and are later used to seed the pseudo and the number generators in the auto init in Riot, so the modules in it, that comes before main 
yeah. And finally, the applications uh, of the secret key protocols and the like can use the secret key from the uninitialized memory. It is worth to say, though, that this is also a little bit dangerous because we leave the responsibility to clear the key up to the user. But this is a design decision. Um, so let's have a quick look at the quality of our crypto fundamentals that we generate um, on the path. Um, so for the general purposes, we simply analyze the bit probabilities in multiple 32-bit integers. As we see in this figure, they roughly follow a uniform distribution on all the tested devices. So, Santa is happy. A bit more crucial are the seeds for crypto purposes. So, we apply our NIST test suit again to approximately 1,000, no, 100,000 things generated seeds on that device. And see there, all tests pass smoothly. So, Santa is happy. As I indicated a second ago, key generation is a book on its own, so I will not go into much detail here. Just as quick, we create 256 bit long keys on more than 300 nodes, and again we use the Hamming distance metric to analyze uh, the distances between keys generated on multiple of these devices, so basically between all the 300 devices included in this measurement. Uh, and as you can see, the distribution of all these Hamming distances um, shows an expectation value of 0.5, which is the optimum case. And furthermore, we ran experiments, in this case seven days of a continuous key generation, um, whereas we couldn't detect a single bit flip that we couldn't correct with our fuzzy extract. So, Santa is happy. I'm much slower than I expected. <laughs> the third advent which deals with performance. So we heard now a lot about randomness, randomness generation, where randomness is used to create secret keys, initialization vectors, and the like. What do we do with all that stuff? Um, we operate cryptographic algorithms um, that use these unpredictable inputs, hashes, max, ciphers, encryptions, whatever. So. Um, we quantify the impact of crypto hardware versus software that are basically located, situated on top of these random fundamentals. First of all, we will have a look at the performance um, numbers on of the metric crypto algorithms, and we display the processing times of AES in two chaining modes, SHA-256 and HMAC, for 512 byte inputs. First, we will have a look at the software performance using write core implementations um, that we execute on the NREF52 platform that I introduced earlier in this talk. Ciphers require 3 to 4 milliseconds, including the encryption and decryption. And hashes are a bit faster than ciphers, take 1 to 2 milliseconds for the absence of re repeated key schedules that have to be processed repeatedly to operate long, um, long sequences with block ciphers. The processing time decreases by one order of magnitude if we use the on-chip hardware crypto accelerator, whereas the NREF52 provides a highly flexible hardware configuration. Start from scratch. What I wanted to say is that this device in particular is highly flexible and configurable, so we were actually a bit surprised about uh, the, the huge performance uh, benefits since the hardware seems quite complex. Still, performance gains of uh, one order of magnitude. So ciphers and hashes now finish in less than 100 microseconds and HMAC SHA takes at most 250 microseconds. The processing time of secure elements, the external devices that take connect via I2C, um, looks a bit different. So we connect these secure elements to the same platform, the NREF52, and, um, the, uh, and the results show that it performs three orders of magnitude slower compared to crypto accelerators. The main reasons for this are twofold. First, we utilize under all these API stacks um, vendor driver implementations that maintain device power states. So before every operation we have to wake up the device and after every operation they set the device to sleep. This takes a certain amount of time. And second, 
control commands and the data needs traver need to traverse the ice plate C bus, which involves a copy to and from the microcontroller. Yeah, IES takes proportionally longer than hash-based operations, since it involves two block, block transfers that each add an overhead. However, it is worth to say that among the presented three devices here, the external secure element is the only one that maintains secure keys in an isolated, tamper-protected environment. So, it might be still worth to consider this device for basic symmetric operations. To summarize, when implemented in hardware, cipher scan a factor of 2 to 30, hash a scan a factor of 5 to 10, and the external device reveals a severe overhead introduced by hardware control and ice could see data transport. So we also analyzed some uh, asymmetric elliptic curve based performances that we operate uh, again uh, on uh, software. In this case, we operate two different software libraries that are kind of different and compare this to hardware alternatives. Thereby, we consider the coming operations for key generation, signature creation, signature verification, and uh, the generation of a shared secret. And the prerequisite for our, our measurements is unsurprisingly the exchange of the public key between two parties. Yeah, furthermore, we expose uh, the init here in this measurements which uh, indicate specific boots requirements of certain libraries. Yeah, first let's have a look at the software performance um, using the MicroECC package. Um, this implementation is optimized for embedded purposes. It's highly optimized, kept minimal, with only few configuration options to the library um, to reduce the firmware complexity. It includes statically compiled lookup tables for the elliptic curves. The time scale now operates at the order of many hundreds of milliseconds, and our measurements show valid results for micro ECC between 180 and 200 milliseconds for all these operations. This is a contrast to Relic. The library maintains a collection of a wide collection of algorithms that are highly configurable during runtime. This is of course most notable in the memory uh, requirements, which I don't present today. Yeah, we have an initial bootstrap with Relic, uh, which requires around 140 milliseconds for calculating a pre-computation table, which optimizes later multiplications. Um, the effect is visible at the key generation and the signing results that reduce to less than 100 milliseconds. Verification and secret creation, however, um, increase in comparison to microECC for the ab absence of a multiplication optimization that we only found specifically in microECC. Considering the sum of signature creation and verification, micro ECC and Relic are still on par. So, our results for the external secure element now operate at a different scale and reveal a different picture as for basic operations. Now, all performs software by a factor of up to five. And it's worth to mention again that this, no, as a side note, remember this device is optimized for single operations on a single curve. So, it's not as configurable as software still it performs similarly. Key generation and signing take a bit longer than um, verification and secret creation in this case, which is inverse to software results. We don't really know why. We assume that um, the overhead of uh, key gen and sign relate to random number generation in hardware, which is kind of slow, as we saw earlier. Whereas verify and secret creation might take advantage of a dedicated multiplication circuit in hardware. We don't know the details. Yeah, and finally, the NRA52 on chip accelerator again performs best analogously to the basic operations. It requires around 20 milliseconds for every operation, which is an order of magnitude below software. Yeah. In contrast to the external device, again, this on-chip accelerator provides a wide range of different curves and um, configuration options. To summarize, the configurability and the algorithmic choice affects, notably affects software performance, and the performance of the external device is on par with common crypto libraries. An on-chip hardware acceleration gains by one order of magnitude compared to software. This was known already. Of course, we did also analyze the energy consumption, which behaves similarly. I think that was the hardest part of this talk. Let's move on to the fourth advent, usability.
Yeah. Um, let's have a look at the usability of crypto and how usable security is coming to riot. There is quite some related work out there that deals with the usability of cryptographic APIs and the impact on system security. I just want to mention some of these references to motivate the need for easy to use and known interfaces that is situated on top of all these crypto hardware, crypto software, library, pop, 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 secure elements. So no one really has to deal with it. The related work that I list here are based on empirical studies that speak about the need for usable security APIs, analysis and struggle with crypto libs, usability of crypto, how unusable cryptographic APIs are. To summarize, the security of a system stands and falls with high level APIs that abstract algorithm specifics and the handling of delicate key material, material from the user. It depends on secure default configurations and the existence of clear documentation as well as example code. So what does that mean for an IoT operating system? The OS needs to provide developer-centering APIs that configure default values securely, commonly already during compile time in the IoT. This reduces the decision space to prevent an accidental choice of insecure parameters. Ideally, the collection of APIs is well established among the developer scene um, then, in this case, there are also high chances for good documentation. Furthermore, existing test cases for algorithms and APIs, similarly to the test sequences from NIST, um, improve the test coverage and consequently the security, the security of the OS integration. And lastly, and this is probably one of the most challenging parts uh, from the perspective of an IoT OS, is the abstraction from different software implementations and crypto hardware backends. So again, on-chip accelerators, secure elements, and the plethora of software libraries that are available out there. As we learned earlier, there are many devices with secure storages that require an ID-based -based key access since the key never leaves the device. This is in contrast to many crypto libs that most of you might have used already, where you simply pass around um, keys directly via pointer to a data structure. An agnostic OS level API should integrate all of these sorts of backends. But due to the heterogeneity of existing IT devices, this requires a fine grained feature modeling that can select proper default parameters at the same time. During our search, for cryptographic APIs, we found the ARM platform security architecture, which provides guidelines for developing secure IoT systems. PSA, how we abbreviate it, consists of four stages, namely analyze, architect, implement and certify. The framework provides developers with resources like threat models, asset trackers, design examples and a complete cryptographic API design. The OS integration is situated at the implementation stage, which includes hardware or software implementations of the PSA Crypto API, and an open source test suite is available on GitHub that we can use to verify our implementations, and finally, systems can actually be certified by PSA. Now, let's have a look at how we integrate the PSA Crypto API in Riot. On top of the API are our well-known linking uh, pullover or Christmas tree applications. There might be other users as well. Uh, and of course, um, the tests. Um, yeah. And below that API is our implementation. Directly, the layer directly below the crypto API implements a key management logic, which bases, um, bu -bu 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 -bu. sorry, what did I want to say here? Ah, yeah. So PSA bases on abstract key descriptors rather than plain text keys, as mentioned earlier. So at that stage, the key management, um, we dispatch whether an encryption key is located externally on a secure element or um, internally on the same chip or internally on the same microcontroller in plain RAM. Yeah, in the case of a secure element, so an external um, key locator, we implement an optional driver dispatch, which allows us to connect multiple of these secure elements. Um, this is to increase the number of uh, key slots available if we want it, or to exploit, vary, exploit varying hardware features of different devices. 
the device, this no, the, the, the secure element dispatcher, called the secure element API, which was initially also designed by the people that designed the PSA crypto API. Somehow they forgot about this API. I don't know. We just utilize it. It fits our purposes. Yeah, and this connects to the uh, vendor implementation of the device driver um, that finally triggers the cryptographic operation on the device that holds the key in its internal memory. Note that in this case, the key information is part, passed as a slot ID. Yeah, on the other side, in the case of an, in, ah, in the case of an internal key, uh, we implement something that we call an algorithm dispatch which resolves the high-level PSA API calls into specific algorithm calls. For example, AES128 in hardware next to AES256 in software or implemented by any software library. This allows us for a fine-grained compile-time configuration of the crypto features and the different crypto backends which we model with kconfig in Riot. Yeah, so the algorithm dispatch either calls a hardware accelerated backend that can operate on plain text keys, we call this a transparent backend, or um, as we introduced with an NRF91, for those who remember, um, they can also operate on chip on an um, internal key slot, slot which we call a peg. So the properties are actually kind of similar to the secure elements, just with the difference that they are located internally. The driver implementation in Riot uses um, vendor implementations internally as well. Yeah. And alternatively, in case of a software backend of an algorithm, the algorithm dispatch calls the software driver, whose API has the same signature as hardware backends, but utilizes the specific library API internally. Just as a quick example, an application that uses the PSA Cypher API chooses AES in Cypher blockchaining mode with a key length of 128 bit, which passes uh, these, these values as parameters. Then the location dispatch, which is not displayed on this slide, finds that, uh, that the key is located internally. Next, the algorithm dispatch resolves the cipher parameters to a specific AES128 CBC call. In this case, the AES120 CBC is implemented by an on-chip um, hardware accelerator and the key attributes indicate an opaque key location. Finally, the hardware executes encryption using the internal key slot uh, and returns the result. Here you see, once again, the overview of our um, PSA implementation and its integration in Riot that allows us the operation of all sorts of cryptographic backends. This approach also allows us a fine-grained OS integration which is vendor-independent and also uh, independent and agnostic to the CPU architecture in front. What I want to say with this, or stress with this, is um, despite the fact that PSA Crypto API was designed by ARM, it is not dependent on the CPU architecture. CPU architecture. Sticking to a standardized PSA Crypto API brings additional advantages to us and flexibility. That means we could, for instance, also integrate al completely alternative PSA implementations into Riot using the right packaging system. For example, Silicon Labs provides a PSA implementation that is optimized for their hardware, and Linaro maintains a reference implementation for ARM that utilizes Embed TLS as a backend. By using the same API, applications become reusable without changing the code, documentation, or tests. Cool stuff. Finally, we made it, <laughs> more or less. This is almost the last slide in this talk. Now, to conclude, Santa says security is everybody's back. From the perspective of an IoT OS developer, me, um, what we can do is, or what we should do is, provide configurable support for the plethora of cheap and constrained devices with varying capabilities. The configurability directly affects the performance and the memory requirements. Special care has to be taken when it comes to random numbers. The results we showed there are not always as intuitive as one might think. Still, it all stays and falls with hardware and platform-specific default configurations that either enable a crypto-secure random number generator or disable it. Yeah. Um, to ease performance and energy consumption, we should utilize hardware most efficiently that 
I'm uh, pointing towards uh, crypto accelerators rather than pure hardware-based random number generators. And finally, the effective, sec effective security is tied to the usability of crypto. As a developer, um, no, a developer-friendly access API should um, provide wise defaults to prevent misuse. And finally, if we manage to satisfy all these requirements, Santa will be happy and enjoys the rest of this evening. Thanks for your attention. We could discuss further stuff right now. <laughs> Any questions? No questions? No questions. Uh, I didn't really get the uh, uh, purpose of puffs. The what? The, the puffs. So if you have physically unclonable, um, could you, uh, if I get it right, could you generate the same seed every time that you power up the device, or is it going to be a bit? Hopefully, I'm, hopefully not. So hopefully, <laughs> talk about the seed. Hopefully not. Yeah. Okay. So this is why I wanted to stress there are two aspects about this. There is this, uh, maybe... The ID and the 900 number, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay, the ID got me a little bit out of the concept. So what you want is... Um, just look at one device for the moment. Um, generate from this SRAM two things. The one is the key, and you always want the same key. Of course, otherwise if it's sometimes this and sometimes that, you cannot authenticate, you cannot do anything reliably on your own perspective. What you need to do for this is to correct some bits. Yeah? Since there are fluctuating cells that do change, and this is what we see here, yeah? um, there are variations on the device across multiple reboots. So to create this key, we need to get rid of this noise. Yeah. How do we do this? using error correction codes that are typically used in mobile communications or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, on the other hand, um, we could use a different chunk of memory that we utilize for seed generation. And there we only want to compress this random pattern. Oh. So we forget about correcting these bit flips, rather we compress the entropy. This is typically done by just iteratively hashing through a block in memory. And to estimate, one, sorry, one last thing, to estimate the entropy that you want to be contained in the seed, um, you have to set up the proper length of the SRAM. I didn't really focus that topic, but this is really important. If there's only, say, 5% of entropy in your puff, um, then looking at 100 bits SRAM, you only have 5 bits of entropy. If you want to seed securely, say, with 128 bits or so, you need 171 bits of SRA in this case. And the situation is even more complex, but I would rather so leave the, the details. The out. assumption to, to some of the assumption is that you have some a, a fraction of uh, any data space that you analyze stays the same, and you can uh, error correct the rest to have your key, and but at the same time, because the other fraction doesn't stay the same, you can use it to generate a seed. Yeah, but I mean the, the fractions that you that you mentioned they are not separated by the memory address. They are distributed all yeah, over the right. rest of them. So let's say every ninety uh, fifth bit flips. Yeah. Every whatever now and then. Yeah. And the others are more or less stable. Okay. Yeah. So these flips get rid of them. Yeah. And otherwise, uh, this is the case for the ID generator. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, do something, whatever this is, um, do something to only look at the bits that change. Yeah. Okay. Luckily, yeah. we have crypto hash functions where you only flip yeah. one bit and um, mm -hmm. the whole digest output changes its statistics. Yeah. So. What if you cannot, can you get reliable, how reliable is it getting rid of the noise? So because if, you know, for some reason you, you know, the, the error checks don't work, the key is wrong. 
two things to say about this. So to the question whether you can detect if the key is um, is correct or not, you could also just whatever sign your key or build a Mac or so and check was it fine, was it not fine. There are also applications out there or protocols out there, protocol designs for puffs that um, that authentic that build in the authentication and you know the other side checks okay is this actually a valid key or yeah. Um, the first thing, and this is probably a bit more complex um, about the error correction codes, yeah, there you have something. Um, first of all, the amount of noise varies with the environment conditions. So this is a little bit sensitive to, at uh, most sensitive to temperature. So you have way more fluctuations when you increase the temperature to whatever, I think 30, 40 degrees already show a notable effect. And you have less variations. Um, if you get cold, where below zero degrees centigrade, so centigrade or so, um, so uh, increasing the temperature, which adds more noise, is obviously beneficial for seed generation and makes uh, the design of the error correction code harder. On the other hand, freezing it, having less variations, is not beneficial for seed generation. So, what we have in, oh, well, I actually didn't didn't say much about it. Basically what you see in this non-existing blue box which says key generator uh, is a concatenation of two error correction codes that you can configure. Yeah. There's another problem with these correction codes. Typically it is based on, uh, on the uh, existence of redundancy. So you pre repeat something, you make it redundant yeah, so you can later correct some errors. Mathematically, this uh, uh, adding of redundancy um, also reveals certain information about the puff response. So uh, the effective amount of entropy contained in the considered SRAM decreases with the amount of uh, redundancy that you add to it. So there's like kind of a trade-off between the strength of the code and the security of the, of the, of the key and the length of considered uh, SRAM. And uh, yeah, well, to give you some numbers, the default configuration, for instance, the configuration that I applied here, should be able to correct, no, leads to mathematically a failure of 10 to the power of minus 1, a bit failure, remaining bit oh, failure of 10 to the power, sorry, a bit failure, 10 to the power of minus 8, that's what I wanted to say. There are configurations that have less of a remaining bit error um, probability more. So this is why I said in seven days of continuous key generation I couldn't detect a single oh, okay. because I just used the proper error correction scheme. I, if you are interested, I can show you later some other plots um, where I used very minimal correction schemes just to check if I am aligned with the, you know, the theoretical value. And um, yeah, of, I mean there I measured something like 10 to the power of minus two, a bit error, uh, remaining bit error rate, 10 to the power of minus two, which could still work out if you have a, like a check is this key valid or not, but uh, it's unusable if every whatever, every 10 reboots of the, of the device, you generate a false key, yeah. but, uh, it's not so usable. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is, yeah, someone yes, answers the question. Um, I forget to pick the good questions, but Puyan first. One last question. Uh, sure. Um, I'm not familiar with SRAM, but you have this um, lifetime cycle for, for example, SD cards that they say after so many read write cycles, you're going to have a dead SD card. Is this something that, that you would say, okay, after so many cycles, I assume that neither my uh, random uh, C generator or maybe the ID only? I got the question. Uh, is it, yeah. um, First of all, I hope this question will be answered by Leandro in his future research project. <laughs> Second, uh, I didn't have, uh, whatever, say five to ten years, which is the horizon of, the, of a lifetime for IT devices. Oh, yeah, so I don't have, no, I mean, to, from the deployment perspective, that is the horizon of the... Okay, of the so it should be more robust than... Uh, yeah, so I don't really know studies. There is work that speaks about um, aging effects, which makes it eventually a bit dangerous, 
we don't really know, we have no numbers about that. Um, what I can say is that the devices that we use here have been up and running since eight years now, intensively on a test bit. We did lots of basically shit with it and um, they are still there and they still operate and they still um, show these values. For the future and improved implementation of the Puff module in Riot, some, um, some logic on top of the Puff would be good. The SRAM, for instance, could easily, you know, just, just vary the address. Yeah? And um, the key generation, it bases on, on the assumption that you know where you start um, to reduce this pattern reliably, but with our implementation that we have available here, if you implement it um, with a software update mechanism, we could also trigger, note it must be a trusted uh, environment, trigger the regeneration uh, of the scheme and of the, of the key generator on a different memory location. So basically a management unit for, um, for the SRAM to be utilized for generating seeds and keys that could somehow solve the problem. So the most simple attack surface would be just turning up the heating and you consider that the ID generation is not going to work. But, but the hardware itself is, is going to be reliable. Yeah, of course. This, I mean, despite the security that stands and falls with uh, cryptographic access APIs, the security also stands and falls with uh, the attacker assumption that you that you that you um, make for your system. So um, there are certainly some attacks that you can run that also have been proven um, if you have physical device access. Um, some things like opening the sock and cloning this hardware, whatever, I, I don't actually know how this works. There, has, uh, there have been some attacks documented. You just cannot prevent from that. If you have advanced hardware knowledge people, um, yeah, there's some remaining risk. But this is rather uncommon. I mean, one of the simplest attacks uh, that the guys in Alan always do is they freeze the uh, devices in the freezer. And then, uh, this is another thing. Um, so, of course, there are always mitigations. I mean, you cannot prevent from people that know how to open the sock and how to clone, like really on the silicon level, um, the, the SRAM up front. Yes, then you can clone stuff. Work has shown that this is possible. On the other hand, if you're just a whatever dummy hacker, um, there are, uh, and you, you freeze the device, for instance, there are mitigations. We have sensors on these devices. So, you could also combine the puff with a um, temperature sensor for instance. Still, this is a denial of service. If you just cool it down and it doesn't operate anymore because uh, the operation temperature is invalid, but at least you don't expose um, secret information. But also, I mean, the typical attacker model is not being in the I mean, we're, we're talking more about like everyday environments. Yeah, they are, there's two things that I also wanted to add to this. On the one hand, the dangerous attacks in the IoT are typically not really the ones that are driven by one person on one device, but rather the ones that you operate um, largely. So a remote attacker that somehow has network access can do something. And here we are relatively, um, relatively on the safe side because nothing of the, of the memory exists anymore mm -hmm. during operation of the device. Okay, there are of course always some backdoors and um, ideally you can prevent from these or, or close these backdoors if you add to the devices that operate a trusted execution environment. So you really cannot access this specific memory that utilizes the puff. But um, what we presented here is more or less a solution for these ship devices that have nothing. We still can do quite some cool stuff, although the, the, the vendor doesn't bring us anything. No hardware, um, random numbers, no keys, no secure elements, no nothing. So usually if someone has access to your device, you probably must have the no, uh, My idea was not just going there, but I mean, uh, I thought if you can somehow bring the device to do some 
heavy calculation, not the thing that would increase the temperature of the device. Ah. And for some reason, you force them to restart. It's, it's just going to generate every time. I mean, I don't know how. I, I, don't, I just wanted to put a whole in Let's not. Story. Okay. <laughs> I didn't get that. <laughs> no, no, I didn't get that, but that's actually a, a good question. I never considered it. But typically, the temperatures that we measure on these devices, you know, common operation conditions, common load, are not in the in the region where you have yeah. problems. Yeah. A simple practical question. Um, I mean, look, looking at these new devices that have uh, crypto hardware support and classic environments and so on, um, uh, how many um, reasonable asymmetric crypto operations can these devices be run with? Can you see, or I don't know, between 100 and 200 million? Uh, how many, in which time? Or, uh, well, I mean, looking at energy or at... Uh, at ah! Uh, at, I mean, uh, um, I, honestly, I cannot answer that question right now. I would have to look into the numbers. Uh, but it's, I mean, it used to be, like, with pure software and these the tiny devices that you were basically... you would consider to do one or two of these operations at all. Uh, and uh, this changed, I guess. I think so. I mean, I don't have the, have the plots here, but um, we did these comparisons and see that in some cases, of course, depends on the op specific operation and the specific accelerator, we reduce the energy consumption to, to 1% in hardware. No, 1% hardware consumes 1% of the software alternative. So at least there's lots of savings. The total amount, I don't know, I would have to... I mean, the math is simple. <laughs> how, my, how, does it, how much does it cost? This operation and how much capacity do we have in the battery? Mm -hmm. yeah, and now, if we charge the battery, the situation changes, but that's probably more yeah, Mickey's question. The rules of thumb mm -hmm. that we, we used to, to consider. Yeah? yeah, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Questions? <laughs> About the integration part? <laughs> <laughs> we should mention that Lena is. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I, I wanted to say it, but somehow I didn't. Yeah, the last chapter is mainly driven by Elena's work. So when is it ready to use? What Some parts are some parts are usable already, but um, I I repeated a couple of times the challenge of configurability and. The doc yeah, yes, also that, but uh, I mean the documentation is not so much up to us, whereas the uh, feature modeling is, and that's a hard thing to do. Plus there's also more about the key management unit, I said simply, is it external, is it internal? The situation is actually a bit more complicated, to be honest. So on the secure elements you have the key slots, where the keys are always stored and they never leave it, and they are persistent and the device goes to sleep and loses all the state and then it comes up and you have this key there, how do you know it's there? Because this is something that you generate during runtime. So there's actually still a block missing in this, in this key management unit and this is a persistent part where you store this meta information persistently. It's uh, yeah, quite challenging. Plus, we would like to look at other code, the ARM reference implementations for instance, but all they do is weird. <laughs> now it's not so weird, but they have a completely different integration concept and they are not as fast. Or they don't show us everything. Could not, also as be as Lena, yeah? not as fast as Lena. Not as fast as Lena. I don't know. I mean, I, to I, be honest, I, I... I wouldn't say they are not as fast. They just have different priorities. So. <laughs> I haven't checked the code recently, but um, from what I know, there hasn't been so much action in there. And as I said, they have a concept that we don't want to apply in Riot, which basically deals with, uh, with the configurability. They have an extra language for that. And then they have a code generator, whereas we have um, yeah, this algorithm, this patch that we model with Gagmatic. Still, we haven't seen their solutions. They just claim to do it this way, or are planning to do it, but we never saw this code generation process. They just say it's simple with Python. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't want to blame them, it's just we couldn't simply go there, take the solution, add it to Riot, end of the story. That wasn't possible. No, this doesn't run Riot yet. I'm wondering if it's actually random as you can do. Can you tell? No, that's why I'm asking. Otherwise, I would just say it's not. So, this testing. 
Yeah, 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 you should then just put some. We, just, we, we have to stand there motionless, we film you, and then we check the randomness in the room. Yeah, another thing that's maybe <laughs> interesting for the people that don't work so much with these devices, all these test suits, they need lots of data to operate correctly. And this is why I separated the NIST and the Die Harder test, because the Die Harder need even more. It takes days or weeks to generate as many random numbers on the IoT device. From one IoT device. Yeah. How yeah. <laughs> totally unpredicted. How large is the churn of IoT boards in the test bed? How often do they have to change them out because one breaks them? I don't know. I really don't know. Because you said you but tested this on eight year old hardware. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean, this, this heavy stuff and the statistics, I, you might have noted I use different hardware, that stuff I ran locally. I mean, the numbers are quite old, actually, two years or so. Um, but I remember over, over Christmas and so on, I had them running for some months, I think, to generate uh, the numbers that we use for the statistical analysis. Of course, one could come along and say, uh, whatever, use multiple devices, they might all have the same properties. Yes, they might, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to really narrow it down. Yeah, thanks again.